The following presentation is taken directly from the ancient and exhaustive Christian document, The History of the Church by Eusebius of Caesarea, on the person of Christ. But he alone, having reached our deep corruption, he alone, having taken upon himself our labors, he alone, having suffered the punishments due for our impieties, having recovered us who were not half dead merely, but were already in tombs and sepulchres, and altogether foul and offensive, saves us, both anciently and now, by his beneficent zeal, beyond the expectation of any one, even of ourselves, and imparts liberally of the Father's benefits, he who is the giver of life and light, our great physician and King and Lord, the Christ of God. For then, when the whole human race lay buried in gloomy night and in the depths of darkness, through the deceitful arts of guilty demons and the power of God-hating spirits, by a simple appearing he loosened once and for all the fast-bound cords of our impieties, by the rays of his light, even as wax is melted. But when malignant envy and the evil-loving demon well nigh burst with anger at such grace and kindness, and turned against us all his death-dealing forces, and went at first like a dog on mad, which gnashes his teeth at the stones thrown at him, and pours out his rage against the assailants upon the inanimate missiles, he leveled his ferocious madness at the stones of the sanctuaries, and at the lifeless material of the houses, and desolated the churches, at least as he supposed, and then emitted terrible hissings and snake-like sounds, now by the threats of impious tyrants, and again by the blasphemous edicts of profane rulers, vomiting forth death, moreover, and infecting with his deleterious and soul-destroying poisons the souls captured by him, and almost slaying them by his death-fraught sacrifices of dead idols, and causing every beast in the form of man and every kind of savage to assault us. Then indeed the angel of great counsel, the great captain of God, after the mightiest soldiers of his kingdom had displayed sufficient exercise through patience and endurance in everything, suddenly appeared anew, and blotted out and annihilated his enemies and foes, so that they seemed never to have even had ever a name. But his friends and relatives he raised to the highest glory, in the presence not only of all men, but also of celestial powers, of sun and moon and stars, and of the whole heaven and earth, so that now, as has never happened before, the supreme rulers, conscious of the honor which they have received from him, spit upon the faces of dead idols, trample upon the unhallowed rites of demons, make sport of the ancient delusion handed down from their fathers, and acknowledged only one God, the common benefactor of all, themselves included. And they confess Christ, the Son of God, universal King of all, and proclaim him Savior on monuments, imperishably recording in imperial letters, in the midst of the city which rules over the earth, his righteous deeds and his victories over the impious. Thus, Jesus Christ, our Savior, is the only one from all eternity who has been acknowledged, even by those highest in the earth, not as a common king among men, but as a trite son of the universal God, who has been worshipped as very God, and that rightly. For what king that ever lived attained such virtue as to fill the ears and tongues of all men upon earth with his own name? What king, after ordaining such pious and wise laws, has extended them from one end of the earth to the other, so that they are perpetually read in the hearing of all men? Who has abrogated barbarous and savage customs of uncivilized nations by his gentle and most philanthropic laws? Who, being attacked for entire ages by all, has shown such superhuman virtue as to flourish daily and remain young throughout his life? Who has founded a nation which of old was not even heard of, but which now is not concealed in some corner of the earth, but is spread abroad everywhere under the sun? Who has so fortified his soldiers with the arms of piety that their souls, being firmer than adamant, shine brilliantly in the contests with their opponents? What king prevails to such an extent, and even after death leads on his soldiers, and sets up trophies over his enemies, and fills every place, country and city, Greek and barbarian, with his royal dwellings, even divine temples with their consecrated oblations, like this very temple with its superb adornments and votive offerings, which are themselves so truly great and majestic, worthy of wonder and admiration, and clear signs of the sovereignty of our Savior. For now, too, he spake, and they were made. He commanded, then they were created. For what was there to resist the nod of the universal king and governor and word of God himself? 
A special discourse would be needed accurately to survey and explain all this, and also to describe how great the zeal of the laborers is regarded by him who is celebrated as divine, who looks upon the living temple which we all constitute, and surveys the house, composed of living and moving stones, which is well and surely built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the chief cornerstone being Jesus Christ himself, who has been rejected, not only of the builders of that ancient building, which no longer stands, but also by the builders, evil architects of evil works, of the structure which is composed of the mass of men still endures. But the Father has approved him both then and now, and has made him the head of the corner of this our common church. Who that beholds this living temple of the living God formed of ourselves, this greatest and truly divine sanctuary, I say, whose inmost shrines are invisible to the multitude, and are truly holy, and a holy of holies, would venture to declare it? Who is able even to look within the sacred enclosure, except the great high priest of all, to whom alone is permitted to fathom the mysteries of every rational soul? This is the Leap of Faith.